we use it as a backup. Cool. Okay, so there's that. And in one minute, I will close all the rooms. Awesome. Thirty seconds. <laughs> the countdown. <laughs> Katie, you're not at the uh, the live event in LA. No, I am. Uh, I'm based in London, so I need to. Well, uh, traveling to us apparently. It's possible, but tricky. So um, yeah, I'm right. just I'm just here in London, attending virtually. <laughs> yeah, but next year. Rooms. Yeah. Sorry, if you're oh, ready, awesome. I'll close the rooms now. Please do so. Yeah. Okay. Are they going to close in one minute? As far as yeah, I, I just—that's something I just learned. <laughs> <laughs> Which is good. Like yeah. there's no. Yeah, I think I they I... have. Everyone has uh, one minute to return by themselves as well. Oh. Hello. There they go. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the main room. Yeah. We weren't Let's rushing say... back, but it was we'd already seen the message saying we were about to be whisked back. So we kind of wound down, I think. <laughs> just very proactively, just, uh, yeah, which is absolutely fine. Yeah. I think we're going to wait for everyone to join as well. Um, and then we're going to go live on the platform on Twitch. Um, and then we're going to start with the panel. So is that going out on Cloud Native TV or something else? Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be part of the Twitch, but well, it's not going to be part of the Cloud Native TV because that's a separate program, but it's still going to be okay. part of the Twitch and it's going to be streamed on um, the CNCF platforms. Katie, if we're not talking as a platform, yeah. Cool. Sorry, Katie, if we're not talking, should, should we go camera off? I remember last year it was like that. So, um, I'll actually, I'm going to introduce some of the best practices as well. Um, okay. Yeah, ideally, okay, I think we have pretty much everyone back, hopefully. Oh, we have someone else in the waiting room as well. Cool. So um, the way we're going to run the panel is more of an interactive session. Um, so this is pretty much your end user prime time with the CNCF and TOC leadership. Um, so feel free to keep your camera on. Um, if you have a question, definitely put your camera on. Uh, you can raise your hand and ask it directly. Uh, or you can put the question in, uh, in the chat as well if you don't feel comfortable sharing your audio and video. So. Again, we were trying to make this as interactive as possible and pretty much make it work for you as well. Um, what I'm gonna do now, well, we're gonna stream this uh, panel to Twitch. So um, I'm just gonna go live on this one and then we're gonna kickstart with, um, with the actual panel. Any questions? I can answer any unclarities that I can uh, uh, deal with at the moment. Cool. If uh, in that case, let me just hopefully go live from Zoom to Twitch, and then we're going to start. Awesome. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the End User Partner Summit a panel that will center on the strategy, vision, and how to best navigate and contribute the cloud native as an end user. We have an incredible lineup of panelists today uh, from the CNCF and TOC leadership, including Priyanka Sharma, Chris Anijik, Liz Rice, and Aaron Boyd. I'm Katie Gamanji, and I will host this panel. Uh, currently, I am the ecosystem advocate at CNCF, and I am leading the end user community which is a vendor neutral group of more than 160 organizations that use cloud native to build and distribute their products. Just as a reminder, we are moderating this panel in Zoom with questions from our end users attendees. However, we will monitor the questions from any live streaming platform such as Twitch, YouTube Live, Periscope, and LinkedIn. And throughout the stream, we'll make sure to monitor these questions and pass them to, to the panel. Now, before we deep dive into some of the questions, um, 
can I ask the panel to introduce themselves, um, starting with Priyanka. Sure thing. Thank you so much for organizing this, Katie. Hi, everyone. I'm Priyanka Sharma, and I'm the general manager of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, or CNCF. <laughs> uh, right now, I, uh, I'm normally based in San Francisco, but right now I'm in Los Angeles for our first ever hybrid KubeCon Cloud Native Con. And I'm so glad to see the virtual element popping just like before, while we also have the in-person joining in. So very nice to meet all of you. And if you ever have any questions or anything, I am most accessible through Twitter. I spend way too much time there. So uh, you can find me there and uh, I'll put my handle in the chat here if that will be helpful for people. Awesome. Chris, would you like to go next? Sure. Hey everyone, uh, Chris Anizik. I have the fun job of being CTO of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, kind of serving our project uh, community and all the craziness that kind of happens across our over 100 plus uh, projects that we have um, you know, now. Uh, I'll be in and out uh, through uh, KubeCon, both physically and virtually this week. So feel free to, you know, find me, whether it's through Twitter or, you know, a Slack DM, but looking forward to kind of catching up with uh, a lot of folks. It's just been, uh, you know, way too long since we've had an opportunity, I think, to connect with folks face-to-face uh, -face and, you know, uh, trying to kind of survive in this hybrid world, um, <laughs> managing my physical time and virtual time across these uh, different, uh, different mediums. So good, good to meet everyone. Thank you for being here, both of you. Um, and now we're going to go to the TOC side. So Liz, would you like to introduce yourself, please, as well? Sure. Thanks, Katie. Yes, my name is Liz Rice. I am Chief Open Source Officer at ISO Valence, which is the originating company of the Cilium project. And I'm the chair of the Technical Oversight Committee for the CNCF. Uh, I'm calling in from London, so it is great that we can do this, you know, mm -hmm hybrid and, and being able to be there, even though I'm not physically there. But if you are physically there, I'm much more likely to be awake early, you know, <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't, don't expect a quick response in the evening LA time, because I will definitely be asleep. <laughs> I'm definitely envious of everyone attending in person uh, at KubeCon at the moment. So yeah, let's have Erin. Uh, could you please introduce yourself as well? Sure. My name is Erin Boyd and I am a TOC member. I have been part of the Kubernetes and CNCF community for years. I've had the great pleasure of working with Liz and Chris for a very long time. Uh, and uh, as, we, as this ecosystem continues to evolve, um, I previously worked at Red Hat, so I feel like the end user community is amazing and that I've gotten both the vendor perspective and also the end user perspective of, you know, not only creating the technologies, but how we use them and can make them better for everyone. So. Welcome, and I'm glad people are able to attend uh, in LA in person. I'm located in Montana, and it's about 25 degrees and snowing, so I'm sure you all are enjoying much better weather than I am right now. I've actually heard that the weather is brilliant there at the moment. Um, so thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, I'm really excited to have, again, the TOC and the CNCF leadership here together in the same room. Um, so the discussion mostly is going to be focused on how end users can navigate the landscape and how they can best contribute uh, to the wider ecosystem as well. Um, and as such, um, my first question uh, is going to be around end user organizations that are currently present in a wide range of industries and sectors from innovative startups to well-renowned enterprises. Um, I would like to hear maybe your thoughts in why do you think the end users currently are at the forefront of the cloud native ecosystem? Um, I can sh chime in with a couple of thoughts. So I think we, um, you know, team cloud native, we built, we started off as a group of you know, almost like dreamers and like uh, visionaries who work together to create this paradigm of computing that is now relevant to every com company in the world. And that's happened for so many reasons. And COVID-19, while such a challenging time for us all, has skyrocketed that, right? I was looking at research and it said that almost, this is from McKinsey and Company, and they were saying that almost every technology, every executive that they are talking to in, oh, sorry. That wasn't me, <laughs> but every uh, uh, that most uh, executives that they talk to don't see 
tech as a cost center anymore. Now it's the way to get edge, to get innovation and to compete with your competitors. And so I think the awareness has, first it started with the developers in these companies and now at the top levels too, they're all on the same page. And so basically the nature of our community is evolving to be much more about the end users, much more end users participating. Um, so it's, it's the trends of the time. Every company is becoming a tech company. COVID accelerated that. The developers were already interested by what we were doing. And so I feel like the stargazer dreamer types that we were in the beginning has now been joined by the the pragmatists and the operators and those are the people who run the world amazing I think I, 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 sorry go for it please I'm going to jump in there but yeah, yeah I, I completely agree with what Priyanka was saying there and um when you know cloud native first started kind of almost by definition it came from the world of vendors and increasingly as adoption grows it's important to hear what end users actually need, you know, and what problems they need solving. You know, vendors, successful vendors are obviously pretty good at figuring out what problems, you know, what solutions to, to create, but they do that by talking to end users. I feel like it's very important that the cloud native community continues to be a successful ecosystem. It has to provide you know, meaningful, helpful solutions to end users. It has to enable people to contribute together and it has to sort of foster an environment where business can take place. You know, the, we, we, it's all about open source, but surrounding that is a, a healthy ecosystem that basically enables lots of people to do their job. And that applies whether they're vendors or end users. So, a healthy mix where ultimately the end users are the people that we're solving problems for. That's, I think, in why they're so important. I think, this uh, is a kind of, oh, Chris, I was about to actually ask the, the technology perspective. So here you go. Yeah, I mean, I think there's like two macro trends going on where, you know, one, I think a lot of end user organizations, adopting organizations have wised up a little bit and are holding their vendors in, in check a little bit by you know requiring a lot of this stuff to be developed in the open. So they have a little bit more clear vision on kind of the roadmap and you know just being able to participate, you know, this kind of old fashioned uh, you know, private customer advisory board stuff just doesn't like, you know, really work anymore. And users are demanding a lot of the innovation to happen. Um, you know, in the open, um, you know, at, at the end of the day to kind of, you know, keep things a little bit fair, uh, you know, overall and a little bit more beneficial for them. And kind of the other big trend is a lot of companies have decided that, you know, they have to bring software in-house or, or more comfortable in sharing things. So if you look at kind of the latest, you know, CNCF projects, you know, you have things like, you know, uh, backstage from Spotify, you know, you know, uh, you know, Envoy from Lyft, a lot of these technologies are being born from end user companies solving problems, and they're more comfortable sharing these things. And I think having a forum in CNCF to kind of allow this, you know, uh, innovation and collaboration amongst, you know, end users and vendors and kind of keeping things fair is, is super healthy and just good, um, you know, for, for technology innovation. Awesome. Now, I would like to maybe transition uh, how end users operate within the cloud native ecosystem to maybe understand better um, some of the positions they can hold in the community. Uh, and I'm going to focus more a bit on the, the TOC side. So this is more a question for uh, Liz and Erin, but everyone else, please feel free to um, share your thoughts as well. Now, after this year's Last year's election, uh, four out of 11 TOCs are coming from end user organizations such as Apple, Spotify, and CERN. Um, and I would like maybe for Erin to share a bit more about the, the role and the responsibility she's holding as an end user TOC. Um, and maybe uh, I would like Liz to share uh, how the TOCs can make impactful decisions for shaping the cloud native landscape. Sure, and maybe we could touch on the question that's here in the chat about the, the widespread feeling that the community is dominated by vendors. I think the TOC really has a mission to be able to uh, encourage the diversity and uh, bring in projects even kind of at their infancy um, in the instantiation of an idea that's well formed. Uh, and you know that's where Sandbox comes in. And so the TOC really has a responsibility to look across the ecosystem, regardless of the size of the company that's producing it, but the health of the community behind it. So I think that that helps 
um, create a the ability for even small companies to be able to participate, have their ideas seen and heard and to grow it throughout the community and understand that. And in terms of end users, I really do think that they keep us grounded in what is actually needed. I think many times as engineers, we are dreamers and we should be, and we love to innovate, but you know, it oftentimes we need to understand that, you know, some of these things are very hard to operate and use and, and we can make them better and the end users help us. And, you know, regardless of the role that people play within a company, I think having, you know, these different levels within the TOC to propose projects and understand their merit by the health and the acceptance in the community, as well as the end user perspective allows us to have um, maybe a more level playing ground, um, given to what um, Henrik's question is in chat. Liz, did you want to add anything there? Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> confusing pop-up about muting myself or unmuting myself okay um so i think one important well a couple of important points one is we as a community you know, wanted to get more end user involvement and you know we opened up additional seats on the end on the toc to end users to get that additional input to the toc um but the second important point is that that doesn't change the role of the TOC. The TOC is here to provide the, the kind of, well, the technical oversight to set the technical direction. And in practice, a lot of that comes from looking at projects and making decisions about which projects, whether they fit into the, into the landscape, what level of maturity they're at. And that role that we're performing there doesn't change whether we have however many end users we have it's it's still the same function um, in terms of getting involved um, not only do we have these dedicated seats in you know in all the different sort of parts of the cncf including the the toc we also have particularly in the technical community technical advisory groups uh, cornelia from the TOC is going to be speaking about this in her keynote, but the technical advisory groups are how we scale our efforts in the TOC, how we lean on expertise in the community. And it would be amazing to have more end user participation in those technical advisory groups. So I thoroughly encourage you and your teams to get involved in the different areas that you're interested in and that's how we can make the best use of and leverage your your expertise those groups are absolutely open to as many end users as want to get involved and just a quick I, point of clarification yeah. the technical advisory group used to be called sigs so just in case you are used to that that's that's been fairly recent um just to make sure we're all using the same uh understanding of what those existed it's good point yeah <laughs> Cool. Um, now, I definitely would like to encourage everyone to participate uh, in, in the tags or actually get elected as a TOC as well. That's absolutely an amazing role to have in the community and we actually have um, a point where it can shape the landscape and actually uh, provide your perspective as an end user as well. Now, I would like to direct the conversation a bit more into uh, the future and what's on the horizon. Um, so lately we had a lot of push to, or not necessarily a lot of push, but we tried to increase the visibility of financial institutions that adopt cloud native and we tried to create case studies or provide those stories to, to the entire community. And I would like to ask Chris and Priyanka, what do you think are the next organizations to adopt cloud native? Do you think we're still gonna be within the FinOps space, regulated industries, automotive? What do you see in the horizon? Um, I'll chime in with my, my experience here is that I think en masse, a lot of different types of organizations are starting to adopt cloud native. Just a, few, a month or so ago, I was in Europe and I did a end user roadshow where I ended up meeting all kinds of companies. And I met uh, Audi, Daimler, Spotify, Deutsche, Deutsche Telekom, which is a telco, so not exactly end user, but all of these very different types of companies were really far along their cloud native journeys. All of them had robust 
big teams in their companies that were the cloud native teams that were creating the developer experience for, by the way, in the cases of places like Audi and Daimler, like tens of thousands of engineers, if not more, right? And so I was frankly really impressed by this leapfrogging that has happened. It, it really felt different from like two years ago. So just based on that uh, in-person experience, I would say automotive seems to be all in and working quite hard. And that type of world, right? Where it's not just automotives, it's even like the plane and train people. They're also getting involved and uh, I think very seriously working on cloud native. So that's one vertical I would say. And then the other of course is the telco vertical where um, I think telcos are so ripe for cloud native now and they know it, that's the best part. Like I don't have to tell them. And we are doing efforts with uh, defining what a cloud native network function is because that's really what one big thing they need to truly go cloud native. So those are two verticals that are, I, I say, immediate expansion. Uh, and, and then I'm sure there are industries that I haven't met yet and it's like cloud natives booming. Yeah, I mean, to echo kind of what Priyanka said, I think it's a lot of these industries who may have been a, a little bit, I don't want to say late to their digital transformation game, but maybe have realized that software has to be a core competency of, of their business. There is a, uh, I think, a, a, a press release from Porsche recently where they basically announced that, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, software has to be our core competency and open source is part of that story. Otherwise, you know, we're potentially not going to be able to, you know, you know, innovate. And you're kind of seeing this trend happen in, in lots of different um, organ, you know, organizations out there. But, um, you know, I had a funny conversation with a uh, a large, uh, let's call it, I don't even know how to like aerospace company, right? It builds, let's call it large planes and, and other things. And they're like, yeah, we're going to be putting like, you know, Kubernetes on, on you know, on airplanes. I'm like, great. Uh, and, you know, they're kind of staffing that, staffing that up and hiring, you know, in-house, you know, talent to be able to, uh, you know, to do that. And just lots of these companies that, you know, just a little bit late to that kind of digital, you know, transformation you know, bringing software and house game that are, are kind of, um, you know, moving here. Personally, I'm very excited to see um, how Kubernetes is going to perform on airplanes. Like, I am looking forward to those stories. Uh, yeah, I, I just hope there's going to be, everything is going to be smooth and they have a very good feel of I think we're, I think we're thinking too small. I want to see Kubernetes in space. <laughs> Okay, I have good news about that. I was talking to folks from JPL, you know, Jet Propulsion Lab. Apparently they're all learning about what's containers and Kubernetes too. So Liz, your dream may come true. That is good. <laughs> Linux went to Mars uh, on, on kind of the little helicopter they had. So why not, why not Kubernetes? <laughs> yes, we can. <laughs> I, of course, have big goals, and I think definitely that that's achievable with this community. I don't think there's anything we cannot achieve, honestly. Um, now, before we move to the next question, I would like to, again, remind all of our attendees to put your questions in the chat or raise your hand, and you'll be able to ask it directly to our panel as well. So don't be shy. This is your prime time. Ask questions. Um, now, I would like to, of course, uh, focus on this week, which is the KubeCon and Cloud Native Con Week. Um, and I would like to ask Priyanka, um, of course, everyone else as well, um, what is the theme of this KubeCon? And maybe could you share some background details of why exactly this is the theme uh, for this iteration? Um, so sorry, but my inter internet cut out for a hot second. And what right? is the question? <laughs> sorry. The theme for this KubeCon and Cloud Native Con, and maybe can, you can share some insights why we chose this one specifically. Yes, absolutely. So the theme, you can see it right next to me, it's resilience realized. And the question of why, right? The PR team is always asking me, how do you come up with this stuff? And <laughs> the answer is really, it's, think about it. Think about the last year and a half, almost two years, right? All of that we've gone through. I think we were the whole world was thrown topsy-turvy and cloud native became, first of all, we had to survive as a community, right? A lot of things that were normal for us, that were usual for us, meeting up in person, having small group events and the cube cons, all that went away, right? Uh, so we had to somehow find ways to take care of ourselves. Second, because of that it was really a speed of light digitization that suddenly started happening with all the companies around the world. We had to take care of the of others too. We became the scaffolding of 
of the pandemic era, really. And so all of this is going on. All of us are juggling, you know, children at home, not going to school, losing people who are, we are so close to have experiencing loss at a mass scale. And the reality is that we all fought through it, right? That showed our resilience. I think the pandemic era has really shown a light on how strong we are as a community. So that's where I got the word resilience from, right? Then it's like, what's resilience realized? Well, if you think about this event happening, the fact that it's existing at all is a realization or manifestation of our resilience. Because I already shared with you all the challenges that we as a community have gone with, and you probably feel it, and I don't even need to explain it to you. But on the other side, just in terms of being able to execute on this event, right? First of all, it's the first hybrid one. So firsts are always tough. Second of all, we are really living right now in what I call, um, well, actually it's not me, what the economist calls a shortage economy. And it's a world where there's shortage of labor, shortage of supplies, there's delays for everything. The Everything is off right now. And the types of challenges that the events team that uh, works with us to build these events out, every possible challenge that could come has come our way, right? And still, we were able to show up. There's so many people in person. There's all of you online and it's happening. And that's our resilience realized. Amazing. Now, I cannot deny the last year has been quite challenging for all of us. And uh, of course, we have more preeminent uh, presence in the cloud native community, which I think is great, uh, a great result of this as well. Um, but in addition to the community, we had new emerging technologies as well. And this is some, another question I would like to ask uh, our panel today. What do you think are the most promising cloud native technologies that will emerge in the next half a year or maybe a year? Any, any thoughts? could start with this. I, th I think some of the areas that we've talked about somewhat relate to the, the conversation uh, a, a few minutes ago about the different verticals. So for example, use in telco and the requirements there around things like latency that are pretty specialist. I think also um, high performance computing, you're gonna see some pretty specialist technology around that. If we look at the sandbox projects, we're seeing lots of, um, I think interesting runtimes, things like Rust-based um, runtimes is pretty interesting. And then, and that's very much sort of in the depths of, you know, how containers are, are, are actually running on the hosts. At completely the other end of the spectrum, I think we have a long way to go with the developer experience. There's lots of interesting work going on there, but getting it, you know, making it very easy for developers to build and deploy their apps in a very normal way without having to write lots of YAML. I think that's huge. And then finally, I can't answer this question without mentioning my current favorite technology, which is eBPF, which we're seeing not just Cilium, which I'm involved with, but um, several other projects like Falco and Pixie um, using eBPF because of the way we're able to hook into the Linux kernel and then use that to instrument all the apps that are running on a given host with one sort of set of instrumentation. So that's my kind of quick run around the technologies I'm excited about. <laughs> Erin, Chris, Priyanka, any thoughts on this one? Um, I'm seeing a lot more maturity towards uh, looking at the security lens in terms of, you know, end to end image signing um, as well. You know, there's obviously from an end user perspective, the the radar that just came out in September, you know, was all around that. And it's still being very difficult maybe to use those and develop those at the same time. So what are we doing and leaning towards, you know, being secure by default um, out of the gate and making sure that we can develop on a platform that um, instills trust. So I'm excited to see also what is happening within the security arena. That's a great point. The supply chain security work is taken off in the last few months. Absolutely. Definitely one of our busier co-located events yesterday <laughs> when I was touring yeah. through all the different uh, ones. So there's definitely a lot of interest there. Um, you know, outside of kind of the excellent, you know, points, you know, made, I, you know, I think, 
you know, that there's an interest in stretching, you know, Kubernetes to support, you know, different types of workload types and so on. I think, you know, you're kind of seeing the same thing that happened with Linux a while ago where people were stuffing it in, you know, embedded devices, cars, you know, like every type of format. I think people are doing the same thing with Kubernetes and trying to figure out like, how does it work for my telco edge cases? How do I potentially run, you know, web assembly workloads? How to potentially, you know, I stuff database, like everyone's just kind of stretching this core technology to meet their specific specific, you know, end user uh, needs. And I think we're going to see Kubernetes kind of uh, evolve in a similar way to kind of Linux has done to kind of support these different uh, end user uh, specific needs. Yeah. And I think um, the reason this is happening is because the folks that have been involved with cloud native, the folks that have been running the Kubernetes clusters, they have this baseline of knowledge that they're being able to verticalize now. And so it's the same folks uh, with an expansion of like, you know, our ranks, but the, it's like cloud native is becoming like the baseline understanding that you need to have. And then you kind of go verticalize and figure out Kubernetes on the edge, figure out the WASM situation, figure out what to do with security. So I think there are offshoots of cloud native developing and uh, the company and the sub communities are getting more like specialized. I couldn't agree. I think like KubeCon is a great way for us to determine what are gonna be next on the horizon <laughs> as well when it comes to the community steps and the technology steps as well. And this brings me to the next question. Um, I am trying to very cheekily get a sneak peek into some of the keynotes. Uh, just briefly, as much as uh, uh, as we can share. Now, this one is um, uh, for uh, Liz and Erin, because in the past, we had the TOCs um, having their predictions around the emerging technologies and methodologies within the landscape. And last KubeCon, we had uh, Justin Cormack actually giving an insight of um, over 80 sandbox, uh, CNCF sandbox projects, which was obviously a very, very rich keynote in, in information. Now I'm trying to see um, uh, maybe um, some details or maybe some insights into the keynote that the TOCs will give uh, tomorrow or yeah, in the next couple of days, let's put it this way. Yeah, so Cornelia is gonna be uh, handling that for us because she's able to be there in person, which is awesome. And she's focusing on the role of those technical advisory groups that we discussed earlier and really how they've already helped scale the activity to do some really good work in some specific areas like different white papers. They've helped us with assessing projects. There's tons of work they've been doing. So really in that keynote, she's going to be shining a spotlight on those different activities. And to add to that, um, you know, it was really important for us um, as a TOC from the beginning to now to be able to actually scale and understand the technologies deeply to have the tags as part of, you know, our success story, where we have people who are entrenched in the details and understand um, what users need, uh, what restrictions there are, what kind of tech still needs to be developed, and they're able to um, talk with the wider community that's concerned with that. You know, there's many tags, there's networking, security, SIG apps, um, you know, it, it defines really all these different cloud native uh, pillars and then has people within those that can discuss that are, that have been involved or getting involved in the community from vendors to end users to researchers even. So it's a very diverse and rich community. And I think being able to highlight that and, and how much they um, help propel the technologies forward and really educate us as a TOC where we, we cannot possibly, you know, go through 80 efficiently um, individually. So they help us scale out and, and provide that fairness that is deserved to people in the community bringing those projects forward. Great, I'm definitely looking forward for the TOC keynote. And I know Priyanka, she's obviously gonna open the, the stage tomorrow. So maybe you cannot share so much, but Priyanka, maybe, uh, could you share an overview of your keynote or maybe the special message that you'd like to share with all of us? Well, let's see. What can I share? No, <laughs> no you know, I think, fine. Yeah. Yeah. no, I'll tell you this, that I think my keynote is a celebration of our community, of our resilience being realized. And I talk about how that's happened because of the power of us, the emphasis being on the word us. And I'll talk about who, who is us? Has that changed? What does that mean that they, that has changed? How do we uphold the awesomeness that we've experienced? 
and the internet connection. <laughs> so many companies are now end users, like the growing and increasing in size. Oh, sorry, did you did I cut out for a second? Just for a sec, just for a sec. Oh, yeah. sorry, but it's fine. Okay, um, but yeah, so basically, it all comes back to more and more companies are using cloud native. So much growth in our numbers. How do we retain the beauty and the ethos of our environment? How do we enable all kinds of people? And that will be the power of us. So you'll hear more tomorrow. Awesome. Thank you very much for sharing all of uh, all of this with us. Um, of course, I hope everyone here is looking forward for the keynotes in the next couple of days and, of course, the sessions. Um, now, so far, we've touched upon um, what in future end users we have uh, on the horizon, what kind of technologies are emerging, uh, some of the sessions that the attendees should uh, attend as well or um, tune in. The last questions I have, the last question I have for the panel is, how can end users get involved and contribute to the community now? What would be your advice to these end user organizations? I think, you know, you all are going out there, utilizing cloud native and doing all the big stuff. I think getting involved with fellow like-minded folks is, is the move, right? It, it's the best way to collaboratively learn and move faster, right? Now, along the way, there are challenges because many organizations, many verticals still have a, a different view in terms of how much, you know, how much they want to open up, how much they want to, uh, be, how much they're able to really like communicate in a larger setting. And I think um, this is where we could use the help of the existing end user ecosystem and community. It's like, spread the word, tell people how useful this is for you. I was in a breakout session and uh, one of the folks, uh, David over there, he was just saying how, how essential the bi-weekly developer experience meetings are for him and how much value he gets out of them. I want to really like beat that drum because people need to hear about it and not just developers, executives need to hear about it because that's when they start seeing, oh, okay, I should really be enabling my developers to go here, or my uh, DevOps professionals to be part of this ecosystem. So I think for us, um, I am 100% confident that the end user ecosystem community, the uh, end vendor community, all of cloud native benefits a lot from being together, from increasing their ranks. It's a matter of getting the word out there so that each and every developer can join. I think I would add that, you know, we, we bucket people into end users or vendors, but actually we're seeing a lot of, you know, increase in contributions from end users, whether that's code contributions, in some cases, entire projects like Backstage from Spotify, um, whether it's getting involved in these tags or user groups or any one of the many different ways that we come together as a community, anybody can get involved in these and if you and your organization can you know devote some I, I i genuinely believe that we're seeing this from end users people are getting more out because they're putting more in and that i i think i would just encourage encourage people to to spend a bit of time working with the community to help us achieve these kind of common goals and i think one of the unique things about the end user community which really embodies open source as well as the level of transparency and candidness that people are able to have in some of these discussions. They're able to bring their struggles and um, you know, use the community as a way to foster solutions and success and, or at least you know, collectively say, it's not working for us either, it's not just you. So I mean, I think it's really a great opportunity for people to come together and help solve a diverse set of problems that maybe even as engineers or even vendors, we didn't understand were there. So I think, um, you know, having that be a sometimes a smaller set of people and very specific discussions helps lead even to innovation, new projects, or solutions that go back to the vendors um, to help solve those problems. So. Chris, did you increase the final remarks? Yeah, no, I mean, I think I think everyone has said great things. I think, you know, one simple thing is, you know, uh, you know, make time in your organizations for your folks potentially kind of show up, you know, to these meetings and, you know, even if they can't necessarily share, you know, details and, and so on, but, you know, being there, making time for it, recording any, you know, information that you find, sending it back and eventually kind of working through 
um, you know, uh, your organization in a way where you could actually make time for open source, you know, contribution. It doesn't have to be code. It could be simply um, ideas uh, and, and so on. And you'll find that a lot of time people in other organizations are, you know, completely free to kind of share information with you, you know, how they deploy, you know, a blob store within their respective company and so on. Like everyone's just barely kind of, you know, helpful, but the first step is truly just like showing up and kind of making, uh, making the time and, and, and kind of meeting people. We have a lot of projects and meetings in, in the CNCF uh, arena. And, you know, we have folks like, you know, Katie and other CNCF staff members that are more than willing to kind of help you and kind of guide you through your cloud native journey. Um. If I may just chime in one last thing to do what Chris has been saying, you know, about just also that the end users are now standing up and being like being a stronger voice in the vendor ecosystem, right? They they are as a collective, your power is more, you, you know, the power of us increases the larger the number we are. And so to that end, I think um, the, the executives, the leadership in the companies need to become aware of the strategic advantage in addition to developer happiness, developer productivity that comes from being part of an ecosystem line like the end user ecosystem, uh, because it just makes them get the best possible results for the technologies they are ultimately going to consume. Um, and I think that's something that we need to get the word out there and ensure that they all hear and absorb. Amazing. Personally, I am very excited to see how the end users will shape the future of the cloud native and contribute back to the community. Um, and I would like to remind everyone, uh, if you'd like to learn more about the CNCF end user community, go to cncf.io forward slash end user, where you'll find insights into how can you join the community and shape your end user story as well. Um, and I would like to take the last couple of moments and thank all of our panelists that joined us today on and all of our attendees as well. Thank you very much for being here and have an extraordinary KubeCon and Cloud Native Con. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, everybody. This was awesome. See you on the sessions. Bye. Thank you.